You guys are fun. Are you, are you having fun? You're hard to, okay, right, you just got one of those. I thought you were looking at me like, I thought this was gonna be the other Chris Martin. Like, you had that vibe. <laughs> you just had that vibe, but you're having good. All right, there we go. You just laugh now, I can relax. <laughs> Okay, how are we doing, DC? Are we good? Um, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, this is my, my first time at, at the DC Comedy Loft. Um, I don't know if you guys have been before. Maybe I'm the dumb one. I, I sort of thought that from the title that the room would be like in a loft, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently we're doing comedy in the depths of hell right now. Um, <laughs> If this recording goes well, hopefully I can move above ground. That's like... <laughs> we all have different benchmarks in our career, but I'd like to become an above ground comedian <laughs> at some point in the near future. Um, on the bright side, if North Korea and America get into back and forth in the next hour and they nuke us, I think we're going to be the only survivors. So um, let's be thankful we're in this in this dungeon right now. Um, <laughs> I, uh, thanks for coming. I, uh, I, I, I've been to DC once before and uh, I just went... To, uh, by the way, I don't need, I, this happened today. So when so comedian says this happened, this happened today. So this might not even be funny. But if it's not funny, we can just snip, snip, snip out of the uh, special afterwards, right? But I, uh, I went to look at the White House. I'm like, I'm in downtown, I go see the White House. And I, I was listening to 80s... 80s anthems for some reason in my headphones and I'm, I'm the White House I'm sure you've all been at some point and I'm you know it's 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 white and big and I'm like okay cool and I'm I just like I don't know why I think this is just I've been on the road for too long but I was like tourists and security and I just had this unbelievable urge to just shout charge and see how far <laughs> just see how far I could get towards before I get gunned down by security I, I think it's like the British red coat in me just like <laughs> I want back what was ours! I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's just... Just how funny would it be, though, if they, like, came to my body and they saw the headphones and they were like, what was he... Was he listening to, like, a manifesto or, like, a right-wing podcast? Like, no, he was listening to Journey, Don't Stop <laughs> Believing. Um, just inspired him to go for it. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's a genuine pleasure to be, to be here in D.C. I, 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 I love... I do... I lived in this country for a few years now, so I'm not just... I'm not making this up. I'm a big fan of America. I, I stayed, I was here for the whole pandemic. I stayed here, didn't go home. I got fully vaccinated in this country. And personally, everyone's different. I was very happy to get fully vaccinated. I, I got my little proof of vaccination card. Um, I just want to know as a group, right? I don't want to sound ungrateful, right, to this, to this lovely country, but did anyone else in this room, when they got their proof of vaccination card, did they, like me, expect it to look more like proof <laughs> all i'm saying is when i was a member of blockbuster video 20 years ago i'm pretty sure they laminated that card <laughs> rather than gave me something that can smudge in the rain very easily like, like i think i have pfizer in my body it could well say pizza on this piece of paper i could have pepperoni in my blood right now for all i know and it, it does make me laugh that there are like some really intense, like there's different levels of anti-vaxxer, but there are some who genuinely think the government are putting microchips in our arms. And when I hear that, I just want to go, mate, based on this thing, I don't even think they know how to use printers. So um, I'm pretty sure you're barking up the wrong tree there, my man. Yeah, I do. I, do. I, li I like it here. I do. I'm still, I'm still trying to get you. It's, it is diff There's lots of differences. One, one thing I've noticed as a man in this country is I feel like um, American men in general, not all, but in general, just much more alpha than a British man. They're much more alpha. Do you know what I mean? Some of you, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That was like the most manly ghost ever. I can't. It just came from the darkness. Yeah. I'm going to haunt you all night, dude. You are. You guys are manly. You are, some of you guys are driving trucks with testicles on the back. It's weird. 
That is weird, isn't it? It's not just me that thinks that's bizarre. Like, the first time I saw it, it was, like, hilarious, because I was in a car and I was like, oh, my God, that's so funny. I'm like, what prankster put those testicles on that guy's truck? And then my friend was like, no, 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 he did it to himself. He did it... He spent money to add testicles to a truck. A truck, already the most stereotypically manly thing, but this guy's so insecure, he's like, i got to add a couple of nuts to that as well. You don't need to. That's like putting a little scrotum on the bottom of your beard. We get it. You're a man. Just a couple of beard balls, in case anyone wasn't sure. I am a man. Guys, the way, the way that men here try and fight is... The way that men are fighting here is... I've seen it a few times. Men here are always asking other men if they want to go. <laughs> you want to go? I want to go! And then they have a fight, and that's very bizarre to me. Just because where I come from, do you want to go just means, would you like to go? <laughs> so when I was in a bar, the first time it happened to me, I was like, I just moved here, like spilt beer on a guy. He's like, you want to go? And I'm like, where? Um, I'll be honest, I don't even know who you are. My mum told me not to go anywhere with strangers, so it's unlikely I'm going to go anywhere, so I'm just going to remain where I am. But I saw these, uh, I saw these two guys getting into it, and like, I live in Los Angeles. This is like in Hollywood, and these two dudes are like in the street, and the first guy's like, "You wanna go?" And the other guy's like, "I wanna go." And then the first guy, within like half a second, ripped his t-shirt off, and I could just see in the other man's eyes, like he wasn't expecting to see nipples that quickly. And he was like, "I'm good, I'm good," and he just walks away. And that was kind of inspiring for me because I just thought that first guy was so confident that it kind of avoided him even having to get into a conflict. And I'm very conflict averse. I'm terrible at fighting. I promise you, I've been in one fight in my whole life. It happened in Italy with my friends. We were walking back from a night out and some Italian guys jumped us and uh, just started beating us up. In the middle of the fight, I put my hands above my head and said, I'm not fighting you. And the guy went, cool, and started fighting me even more. He was just like, <laughs> First rule of Fight Club should be don't put your hands above your head and say I'm not fighting you because then you get many punches to the face, right? <laughs> so these two guys are getting into it in the street and then the first guy gets top of someone. That guy's inspiring. He just got, he just avoided a fight by being super confident and just getting half naked as quick as he can. <laughs> so I thought I should use that information. If anyone tries to get into it me, if I can just as quick as I can get half naked, it will avoid me having to get into a conflict. But I realised I'd probably have more success at avoiding the fight if I got bottom half naked. <laughs> this guy's like, you wanna go? I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> the guy's like, I'm actually gonna stay. I retract my invitation. <laughs> Sorry for disturbing you on this evening. So I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm getting used to it, though. I'm getting used to the country. But even when you get used to it and you've lived here for a few years, I, I, I find, like, I still make, like, a rookie error. And I do think the biggest rookie error I made culturally in this country was last year, I joined some of my British friends for a bachelor party in Las Vegas for five days. Yeah, yeah. My new, this is my new favourite thing, telling a room of Americans I went to Vegas for five days. Because you guys act like I just said I went to fight in Iraq for 12 years. As soon as I say it, I can hear someone in the back go, dude, too long. Five days, way too long, buddy. You want to die? That is how you die. And then what you guys like to do, I've noticed, is show off to me about how tiny a time period you go to Vegas for. So, dude, when I go, two days max. One night, two days, that is it. Uh, sometimes I walk into a casino, roll one dice, leave immediately, that's it. Strip club, one nipple, thank you, Vegas. That is enough, Vegas. And it is too long. You guys, are, it's way too long. Five days, too long, especially because on the first night, we were exclusively drinking espresso martinis. Now, yeah, you guys have had... I'd never had them before, but after drinking them for a whole night, I realised afterwards why they are not the martini of choice of James Bond. That man would have completed way less missions if he was drinking espresso martinis, unless two of his missions were to black out and get diarrhoea. Those are the only... Those are the only two missions that were sadly completed that evening. 
But here's the thing. It wasn't just that. We like, it was like, I was with a bunch of British guys. And this is like a couple of, I'm 37 now. So uh, back then I was like 35. It was like a, a bunch of us. And uh, we had this weird thing happen when we went into a, a, a nightclub. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have, have been to the nightclub thing in Vegas at some point. I've realized that experience feels very different for a bunch of men compared to a bunch of women. A bunch of women, a Vegas nightclub seems delightful. It's like, come in, it's free. Have anything you like. <laughs> Men, you're like, can we come in? They're like, yeah, that's just a million dollars each. That's... <laughs> and it's terrible. It is not fun at all. We're in this VIP area. We're like watching people have more fun than us outside the VIP area. <laughs> and then my friend, uh, he kind of like capped it all off. I don't think I could use his real name, so I'm just going to call him Clive. So Clive, <laughs> he is fully asleep in the VIP area. And the bouncer, I see him come over and the bouncer just goes, uh, this guy shouldn't be asleep. And I'm like, mate, we're all in our mid thirties and it is 2 a.m. on a Thursday. He should definitely be asleep. <laughs> None of us should be awake, actually. We're the weirdos in the group. And I actually, I've realized as well that I, I know I'm getting too old for nightclubs because I, I've realized my, my uh, reaction to getting kicked out of a nightclub has evolved with age. That's something I'm not, uh, in your twenties, you think the bouncer's gonna kick you out? And I realize in my 20s, I'm there going, please, please, please don't kick me out. Then I hit 30 and I was like, all right, I guess I'm getting kicked out. Once I hit 35, I'm there going, how the hell do you get kicked out? I would <laughs> love to get kicked out right now so I can leave with my head held high and get my eight hours this evening, right? I used to look at two men having a fight in a nightclub and go, what are you idiots doing? You're going to get kicked out in a minute. Now I see two men having a fight in a nightclub and like, they're the smartest men in here. They're, they're going to get an early night and some cardio in. I am jealous. I am jealous of their routine. My favourite, actually, I remembered it. My favourite getting kicked out of a nightclub story happened in America. It's when I first visited here. I was in my mid-twenties. I, I was, came with some friends and I... And I'm in this, uh, I'm in San Diego. I'm in a, in a, in a bar nightclub in San Diego. And I, uh, I was very, I'm British, so in my 20, I was very, dr I, was, I think I would describe myself as drunk, drunk. Because I think there's drunk where you're hammered and everyone around you thinks you're hammered, but you're in your head going, I'm a sober boy. I could drive heavy machinery right now. I don't know why people are looking at me. But then I was drunk, drunk which means I was standing there going, I can't believe they're just letting me exist in this place right now. It should be illegal for me to be outside the house, let alone still in this place. And I see the bouncer walk towards me, but I'm in my mid twenties. I see him come towards me. I'm like, man, please, please, please don't kick me out. And he goes, don't worry, man. I'm not gonna kick you out. And I still think this is the coolest thing a bouncer's ever done. He just goes, follow me. And I go, okay, and I follow him. <laughs> We end up outside and he just goes, I'm just not gonna let you back in. I'm like, that's actually very clever. I wanna hate you, but I admire you. So my friend Clive, he's asleep in the VIP area. And, uh, and so we're like mid thirties. So I'm like, you're gonna kick him out, that's fine. And then the bouncer goes, no, 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 man, I'm not gonna kick him out. I've like, heard that before. <laughs> but he go, I promise you, he goes, I'm not gonna kick him out. And he just gets his radio out and just goes, bring up the wheelchair. <laughs> And I was like, what? And then I promise you, there was like a curtain behind us and just another bouncer emerges with a wheelchair like he's been waiting all evening for his moment to shine. The wheelchair lands and he goes, help us put him in there. We had no idea where they were taking him. They could have been about to push him off a cliff, but we're British, we're happy to help, there you go. And I say, just out of interest, where are you taking him? And he goes, to the basement. And I'm like, that doesn't sound promising. Um, very rarely do good things happen in basements. Apart, apart from this gig, very rarely do good things happen in basements. So I go, can I go with him? And the guy goes, yeah, no worries. I promise, I follow my friend, get like pushed through the dance floor at this place called Zook. We go through the dance floor, we get to some stairs, we go down some stairs, and I promise you, we open a door in the basement to a room where there are nine other men passed out <laughs> on hospital beds with IVs in their arms, right? Well, there's a nurse, she's working there. She's checking all of their vitals. They tip my friend onto an empty bed. There's like a semi-conscious guy sat upright. The nurse points at him and says to the bouncer, this one's good to go. <laughs> they put him in the wheelchair and wheel him back into the nightclub. Don't you just feel happy knowing that that room exists in this world? 
Not only does the room exist, I think my favourite thing about it is there is a qualified nurse who is working in this room. And I already thought nurses were some of the most amazingly undervalued, important members of society. Like, some are out there and they choose to specialise in bringing new life onto this earth. Some were on the front lines in COVID, putting their bodies on the line to save lives. This one, the greatest of all of them, has chosen to specialise in reviving drunk people and firing them back into a nightclub. And we should all be banging up pots and pans to her, shouldn't we? What a hero. She is a modern day hero. All I'm saying is, if Jesus, when he died on the Friday and came back on the Sunday, if he hadn't died on the cross, but instead died in Zook nightclub, but he wouldn't have come back on a Sunday. He'd been back an hour later on the dance floor, cutting shapes of the disciples. Thanks, guys. You guys are fun. Are you, are you having fun? You're hard to, okay, right, you just got one of those. I thought you were looking at me like, I thought this was gonna be the other Chris Martin. Like, you had that vibe. You just had that vibe, but you're having good. All right, there we go. You just laugh now, I can relax. <laughs> But yeah, no, I do, I, yeah, I've got Vegas wrong. I, uh, but I, I, I'm trying to get more with the culture here. And I know every city is different, so I don't want to generalize too much, but like uh, living in Los Angeles, like everyone's into doing therapy. And uh, I've, started, I've started doing therapy in the last couple of years. But yeah, thank you for, you do therapy? Yeah, that, that, that's the creepy laugh again. <laughs> Gonna need therapy when he haunts me, yeah. It's just, as a Brit, don't we have any British people in? Brit, do, doing therapy as a Brit is like, that is just so not in our DNA. Like in the UK, the idea of paying someone to listen to you talk about your feelings is like, no. What we do in the UK instead of paying for therapy is we push our feelings down and then cry during the final to the Great British Baking Show. That's what we do, right? <laughs> That's how we deal with emotions. But I do, I'm enjoying it, right? I like my guy, but there's just like, the one thing I'm gonna say right now, if people do the therapy or if there's any therapists in, I've only ever done it because of the pandemic on video chat. And my one observation is if you're a therapist and you're doing video chat therapy, keep that shot tight to your face. Because my guy, lovely as he is, has his camera there while he's chilling back here. So I see his whole living room, which means I start looking at his life and start to wonder whether he should be guiding me through my life. And there's just a couple of red flags. Red flag number one, we're in the first session. He seems cool, we're talking. And I like look and I see in the corner, he has a doorway from his living room to his kitchen. And in that doorway, he has a horizontal chin-up bar and I'm like that man is not happy with his life if he's got a chin-up bar in a doorway is a cry for help and um, some of you laughing some of you like I need to remove that chin-up bar when I get home tonight <laughs> serial killers and assassins in movies are the only people who should have chin-up bars it's like that was the one red flag but the bigger one happened to be like a couple of weeks in we're talking away and then it's out of nowhere he goes you're probably wondering why I've got a t-shirt on my wall. I was like, what? And I look. Now all I can think about is why has he got a t-shirt on his wall? He's got a t-shirt just loosely dangling on his wall. And he just said, I put that on the wall to cover up something underneath it. I don't want you to see. <laughs> and I'm like, if you've got something on the wall you don't want me to see, just take it off the wall, man. Don't shroud it in mystery under an ACDC t-shirt. Because now I'm there going, what has he got under there? This is going to creep me out. What could he possibly have? He's got a swastika. He's got a swastika. This guy's a Nazi with a swastika. That would be the worst, creepiest thing he could have. And I'm like, is it the worst thing? And my brain goes, actually, no. He could have something worse than a swastika. He could just have a sign up that says, live, laugh, love. That'd be worse. <laughs> if I saw that up there, I'd be like, I wish he had a swastika on his wall. That's horrific. <laughs> And then I went away and I said, all I could do is like for the next day, I was like, what could he have? What could he have? And I was like, what would be the creepiest? What would the creepiest thing? And I think I figured it out. Creepiest thing by a mile would be at the end of a session, if he just pulled the t-shirt down and it was just a picture of me, just there. <laughs> You thought you chose me as a therapist, Chris, but I chose you all along, my friend. <laughs> But he's, I, I, yeah, I, I know every therapist's different. He's got, he, he's got me, and this is against my best nature, he's got me 
manifesting right now. I don't know if people do If you don't know the manifesting is where you visualize what you want your future to be and you do it. And uh, I think from doing it for a bit, I have realized that manifesting, I'm pretty sure, is something you only do over the age of 30. Uh, <laughs> Because people in their 20s are just like, if I just keep being me and trying my best, everything's gonna go great. And then you hit 30 and you realize your life hasn't quite panned out how you wanted it to pan out. So you just think, screw it, let's try magic. Let's see if that works. <laughs> Turn into a wizard, cast some spells, see if that helps me out. So I'm doing the therapy, I'm also, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm also, this is, I'm just the most clean. My British friends don't understand what I've become. I've also become a vegan since living in LA. I'm a, have we got any, any vegans in? No, they never are. <laughs> they never are, man. People, don't, people get annoyed with vegans. People think we're very tedious and fussy with our diet. But the one thing about living in Los Angeles, I re at least the vegan diet, like it logically makes sense, I understand. People in LA have the most insane diets I've never heard of in my life. The other day I was having lunch with my friend Sasha. She orders her food and I was like, oh, do you not eat meat? She goes, no, 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 I eat meat apart from pig and octopus. I was like, what? <laughs> two very random animals to not eat. I go, why don't you eat those two? And she went, because they're too intelligent. And I'm like, that is some coastal elite level logic right there. <laughs> Ivy League animals, I don't touch them. But all the morons get in my belly, thank you very much. If you're an idiot, I will kill and eat you. Your feelings don't matter to me if you failed your SATs. <laughs> That's like going, I don't punch strangers unless they went to community college. <laughs> Bang! Take that! Ah, hit the books or I'll hit you! <laughs> it's, as insane as that is, is that the logic that people use when they have this diet? And maybe some of you are in the room with this diet. There's the diet that is, People have more and more now where they go, um, I, I don't eat animals apart from fish. Um, is that the same logic? Because I don't want to come down too hard on fish, but I do think, hands down, by a mile, fish look like the dumbest of all the animals. Don't know. <laughs> fish look permanently baffled. They are able to breathe underwater, just like... open and I'm somehow not drowning. How is this happening? <laughs> they look dumb and here's the thing, right? I don't know what comedian you guys thought you were seeing, but um, when it comes to edginess, I'm going to I'm going to double down. I'm going to go hard on the fish right now, yeah? <laughs> not only do they look dumb, I think fish fish have to be stupid. They are dumb, aren't they? Especially the ones that fall for that trick where they end up eating the worm on the end of the line. <laughs> Like, do you think their last thought after they chomp down on that is, ah, I can't believe I fell for that. <laughs> Worms don't even live underwater, so... <laughs> I should have known something was amiss when I saw a land-dwelling animal just floating in the sea. It's, it's called an earthworm. The clue is in the title. It says earth in the title, and it was in water. I deserve to die. I deserve to die. Like, I would feel very, very stupid if I was, like, walking through somewhere like Home Depot and I just saw, like, a burger hanging from the end of the line. <laughs> I was like, nothing weird about this. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... I, I get people... The, ve the vegan thing, people... No one's vegan, that's the thing. It, it, you see, it talks about all the time in the news and people are trying to push the, you've got to be vegan, but it's mad. Like, in this whole room, no one else is vegan. And so every, I keep thinking, why are there not more people that are vegan? Because you've heard stuff where it's good for you and the planet and all this. But I, I've realised, I don't think a lot of vegans will say this, but I think the reason that, that almost no one is vegan, despite a lot of evidence saying it's quite good for you, uh, it's just, it's a harsh reality, but the reality is our food tastes less good that is the truth <laughs> it tastes less good it does here's how i know this every time i've ever eaten like a top shelf delicious vegan meal i found out quite soon afterwards it accidentally had meat in it um <laughs> every single time like, mm, what is that flavor it's it's flesh it's dead succulent crispy flesh 
It's every single time. Like, and here's the sad truth. Like, I, every time I eat meat by accident, it happens like every couple of years. I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. Like, you'd think, like, after a few years, like, my body would reject it. But no, no, no. Um, just turns out absence makes the belly grow fonder. It really does. <laughs> if you think meat is tasty, try surprise forbidden meat. It is. <laughs> mwah, mwah. My favorite meat. Uh, accidental consumption happened. I was in I was in uh, Korea town um, having dinner with my my friend who's Korean, and I ordered a tofu vegetable hot pot because I know how to live. So I ordered that, <laughs> and I'm eating it, and this is so tasty. And I'm like, what is all this grey stuff in it? It's great. And then uh, it, it was it was pork, just so much pork. It's like <laughs> it's like they'd killed a pig and sprinkled some tofu and vegetables on top. And I'm like to my friend, this is pork. And she's like, yeah. I'm like, but it wasn't on the menu. She's like, dude, this is a Korean restaurant. It's like our butter. It's in everything. <laughs> she's like, go into the kitchen, peel a banana. It's gonna be a sausage. That's what it is, right? <laughs> I didn't realize, but it turns out like pork to Korean food is like Kevin Hart to movies. It's in there whether you want it to be there or not. Can't be stopped. But yeah, it's uh, I'm, some comedians will just talk about how annoying their wife is and all that stuff. I don't, it's not my vibe. I, uh, I know I'm, in, I'm into being married. I t I, I, I've been married for eight years. So I don't know if we've got like married people in here, but I have noticed like the longer I've been married, the more like I've kind of started to understand stuff I got told about it before. Like, uh, the day after I got married, I was on my honeymoon, and I'd have all these older men. Like, older men love to talk to you about marriage, like it's this thing, and every guy was like, you just got married, you know what they say, man? Happy wife, happy life. Happy wife, happy life. And I'm sure you guys have heard that phrase, and I was like, what, what are you on about? And now I've been married for like eight years, I've realized that phrase, happy wife, happy life, that phrase makes so much sense, doesn't it? But the reason I realized it makes so much sense is only men need a rhyme <laughs> to remind themselves to bring joy to the person they've decided to spend their life with. <laughs> Women don't need a rhyme. They're just nice because they know to be nice. Women are like, happy groom, happy womb. They don't need a rhyme. <laughs> they just know. But having been married, you know, it is, a, it is a thing where you keep learning. And I, I, I used to think, before we got married, I used to think, my wife, you get married to someone, and then she's going to trust me more than any person on the planet. But now I've been married for a bit, I have discovered my wife trusts me less than any <laughs> organism to have ever existed. Because I think it's because she's seen me mess up more than anyone else, right? You meet a stranger, you kind of see their, like, their highlights, but she's seen my bloopers reel. You know, she's seen me smash my shin on the same corner of the same bed that's been in the same place. I'm like, oh, how, every time, same place. This is how little she trusts me. We went for dinner the other day and uh, I, I, I parked the car and I'm about to get out. And uh, she goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm getting out of the car. And she goes, yeah, but you just parked on a yellow curb. And I'm like, yeah, but it's after 6 p.m. And I don't have the same in DC, but in Los Angeles, I'm like, it's, it's free to park on a yellow curb after 6 p.m. And she goes, are you sure? I'm like, all right. So I get my phone out and I like, I Google it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's free to park on a yellow curb after 6 p.m. She goes, okay. But I could tell it was not okay. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't okay because we crossed the street and we're walking a little bit away from it. And she keeps looking back at the car. <laughs> like the car's gonna go, Psst, he's lying. <laughs> And then as we get a few yards away, a, a man walks past our car, just, just a man. And she just shouts across the street, excuse me, can you park on a yellow curb after 6 p.m. in Los Angeles? Just a man. A man whose only qualification was being near our car and not me. That was his only... <laughs> He wasn't even in a car, he was walking. He asked him about jaywalking, not parking. It wasn't even the fact she didn't trust me. She didn't trust my ability to read words on the internet accurately. I go, what are you doing? She goes, I'm getting a second opinion. I'm like, that's not a second opinion. Ask a parking enforcement officer, it's like an expert. That's what you do for a second opinion. For the same reason, if you go to the doctors for one opinion, you then see another doctor for a second. You don't walk out the first doctor's surgery, stop the first man that walks past, and go feel that lump. You don't do that. 
So my wife doesn't trust me, but what she gets annoyed with me for is I never back her up when I should back her up. Like the biggest example of this was we were, she was like driving the car the other day. She's driving it and uh, she changes lanes and then a guy behind starts like honking on the horn. And she goes, oh my God, that guy's an idiot. Why is he honking at me? And what she wanted me to do is go, yeah, but I went, I mean, <laughs> you didn't really signal early. <laughs> She goes, why aren't you backing me up? I go, I'm just, I just want justice in this world. That's all I want. <laughs> and then she, she got so annoyed, she said to me, she goes, you, she, like, you never back me up. You never like defend me. She goes, if I like murdered somebody, would you tell the police? And I said, I absolutely would not tell the police if you murdered someone. She goes, okay, good, because you love me. And I'm like, no, because I know that you're capable of murder. So. Um, <laughs> There's love, and then there's snitches get stitches, and that's just the rule of the world. No, it's 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 exciting times for us because we are. This is. I think it's. I'm doing the math. I think we're having a, we're having our first baby in five weeks. That's great. Yeah, five weeks. Thanks. Someone, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Overpopulation. Give it a round of applause. I love it. I um I I'm excited to have a kid. I don't know if we have many people in here with kids, but I um I've noticed. Uh, I, I I'm I'm 37, so I'm like the last of my friends in the UK to have a kid. Like, all of them already had a kid a few years ago. Uh, but it's, di it's different when you live in LA. Uh, if you guys know LA well, um, having a kid at 37 in LA, I'm, I'm like the youngest person anyone knows to have had a child in LA. Like, having a kid at 37 in LA is like being a teen mom in Alabama. People are like, <laughs> just slow it down, buddy, all right? Not, not yet. You've got your whole life ahead of you. And here's what I've noticed, and it's just because the kid hasn't been born yet, but I've noticed that people with kids, when you don't have kids, you guys are kind of running a scam that you kind of you kind of let the, the veil drop once someone you know has the kid. But before I was, we were pregnant, uh, my friends who've got kids in the home, they're always going, oh man, you've got to have a kid, mate. Life is, ah, oh, now, now I know the meaning of life. Now I've had a kid. You've got to do it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. As soon as I mention them going, guys, I'm having a kid. They're like, you'll never sleep ever again. <laughs> We got another sucker! <laughs> People who have kids when you don't have kids, you guys are like realtors before the person signs on the dotted line. That's right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're like, oh, this is a beautiful property, it's spacious, great neighborhood, lovely modern accessories. As soon as you sign on the dotted line, they're like, ha, 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 the house is built on quicksand and the roof's made of ham. Ha, ha, ha. When it rains, you're gonna get ham on your face, you idiot. Ah. <laughs> And I, I don't, I, I'm kind of nervous about being a dad. I don't really have any experience of doing something like that. The closest I have is I'm, I'm, I have a dog, which is, uh, I have a, uh, someone said to me, it's just the same as a dog. I'm like, well, that is a terrible dad right there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't know, I do, I think I'm a good dog dad. I think I'm a good dog dad. It's, my dog is a little tiny cute guy. He's called Santiago. He. Uh, he, he's so cute, it, it takes about um, two hours to do a 20 minute walk because everyone wants to stop and do the talk, which is, I'm thinking of basically shaving a QR code on his back that says his age, his gender, his name and his breed. So they're like, well, yeah, just, just scan it, just scan it. I've got to move, I've got to get back, right? But I do love having the dog. The one thing I don't love, and this has taken me a while to understand, is I, um, I'd never had to go to a vet before because, uh, you know, I never really had a, a dog. So I've got the dog and I had to start going to the vet and it's kind of blown my mind, the vet, because before I had a dog and before I went to the vet, I used to think these, the vets were like these experts that understood everything about animals. But now being a few times, I have realized what happens with the vet is uh, you pay them a lot of money and then what they do is they guess. <laughs> what might be wrong with your creature. Uh, every time I take him in, they're like, it could be a number of things. I'm like, yeah, that's why I brought him to you. <laughs> to get the number down to one thing. They go, well, if you want to do that, we'll have to do an x-ray. I'm like, how much is an x-ray? And they're like, think of the biggest number you've ever thought of in your life and then double it. That's how much an x-ray is. And I'm always there going, how can an x-ray be that expensive? Now, surely I could just spend like $50 on a Spirit airline ticket, get to TSA, put my dog on that little conveyor belt thing, and when he goes through, take a photo on my phone. 
And my vet's very nice, but she's, I feel like she's always trying to like up the tab on me. Like every time I go in, she's like, has he had dental? Has he had dental? I'm like, unless he's come in on his own, I don't think he's had dental. <laughs> Check his mouth. There's no like doggy Invisalign in there. He's not had dental. I'm like, how much? How much is dental? She's like, it's gonna make X-rays seem cheap. I'm like, all right. Is it good? I'm like, what? Well, I'm like, but why is why is dental so expensive? And she's like, well, because we have to put him to sleep. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, just a heads up on my dog. Um, he is asleep 22 hours of the day. So. <laughs> Why don't you just nip over any time and save some cash? She goes, no, but you have a small dog, and the thing with a small dog is you have to get an extremely well-trained anaesthetist, because if it goes wrong, there is a small chance he might die. And I'm like, okay, what if we don't do the dental? She's like, well, then he could get gum disease. I'm like, and then what? And she's like, well, then there's a small chance he might die. So I'm there going, can I just get the free small chance he might die? <laughs> Because if I pay for it and then he dies, I've accidentally hired a doggy hitman I didn't want to hire. <laughs> but I say that, like, I will say this. I'm, I'm just being lighthearted. Any vets watching in the crowd or at home or anything, I, I do love my vet and I love my vet for this one reason. I think she gave my dog the greatest diagnosis of all time. I was, I was walking my dog down the street last summer and every like couple of yards, he would freak out and sit down. He'd freak out, sit down, freak out, sit down. I'm like, all right, what's going on with him? I take him to the vet, tell the technician. My dog just keeps freaking out and sitting down. She goes, all right, tell the vet. Vet comes in like a minute later, doesn't ask, like, uh, any, it doesn't like touch him or like prod around him. She just comes in and says, let me ask you one question. She goes, he just keeps freaking out and sitting down. I want to know, did he ha used to have a lot more hair till quite recently? I was like, yes, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, like he had way more hair like four days ago, but it's the summer, so he decided to cut it all off. She goes, all right, here's what's going on. If your dog keeps freaking out and sitting down and he used to have way more hair till quite recently, I think your dog is suffering from and there is apparently no more medical terminology than this, from a breezy butthole. <laughs> and when she said that, I said, you're gonna have to repeat that. And let me record it on my phone several times, because it is not every day a trained medical professional diagnoses your dog with a drafty anus. It just doesn't happen a lot. And I, I promise you, I'm not making this up. This is a real thing. Apparently, if your dog has loads of hair blocking that area and you shave it away and the wind goes up there, it freaks them the hell out. And I have never felt more connected to my dog than when I heard that information. Because if I was walking down the street and unbeknownst to me, someone had cut like a hole out of my trousers and underpants, and I felt that gust, I would sit down and never stand up ever again. Ah, <laughs> oh, so yeah, I, uh, the, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna be a good dad. I, I, I look at my dad, I look at my dad, as my like shining, and uh, I, I'm, sh I'm sure people here have different dads. I think there's kind of dads go into two categories. I think there's quite a stern, serious, disciplinary dad who gets stuff done. And then on the other side, there is the quite lovely, floaty, happy-go-lucky dad who is the most useless person at anything <laughs> in the world. And my dad is that guy. He's like lovely, but like, he is just, he doesn't know what he's doing. And like him and my mum are still together. So that's good. They've been together for 40 years, but uh, they have had to work at it recently. Uh, my mum revealed to me um, at Christmas that they, uh, they've been going to couples therapy. And I'm like, oh, I just couldn't imagine dad doing something like that. I go, how is it? She goes, it, it's, it's fine. Apart from whenever I start talking about your dad in detail, he just falls asleep. <laughs> I went, pardon? Uh, and I go, really? And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, if, if it ever gets too uncomfortable, he just, he just, mm, he just. <laughs> and apparently it's not even that weird. I, th I think it's like a weird, apparently it's like a male self-defense mechanism. <laughs> this is too much. Mm. <laughs> You've heard of fight or flight. Apparently there's also night night. I didn't realize, right? <laughs> 
And I'm like, I'm still, I'm happy they're together, but they do, they are at a point in their relationship that I look at and I go, all right, so they're having to work on it. I go, is that, I'm like, is that where we're destined to be, me and my wife? Because I've been together eight years, they've been together for 40 years. And I'm like, is this, a, is, this a, is this our path? And I know every relationship's different. I don't think this is normal, but I also discovered, as well as the therapy thing, that at Christmas when I was back, I found out they're at a point in their relationship where my mum has had to start hiding food around the house so my dad doesn't eat it. <laughs> it was very weird. I was in the kitchen. I go to my mum, uh, Mum, have you got any nuts? And she went, come with me. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, she leads me out the kitchen to like a room attached to the... I didn't even know there was a room. I, she, I think she had the room installed for this reason. She pulls out like this box under a shelf and in there there's like nuts, candy, cookies, but the oddest item she had in there was a pot of honey, and I'm like, is that honey? And she went, that's where I keep the good honey. <laughs> I go, what do you mean the good honey? She goes, if I leave that out on the table, your dad eats it too fast, so now what I do is I buy cheap honey, leave that out for him to eat, and while he's not looking, I come in here and yum, 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 yum. <laughs> That is like Thomas Crown Affair level planning from Kathy Martin. She is buying decoy honey for my dad so she can eat the good stuff. That's genius. And I'm like, but I'm like, how much honey does he eat? She's like, just watch him. Just watch. He eats a lot of it. Just keep your eyes. And I'm like, all right. Next morning, me and my dad were having like breakfast together and uh, he's got toast out and he's, ju he's just pouring, just like the upside down, just honey slathering it on top. And I'm like, Dad, that's quite a lot of honey you're putting on that toast. And he goes, whatever you do, don't you dare tell your mother. And I'm like, I think she might have an inkling as to what's happening. <laughs> and for me, that was just a beautiful moment because it's rare that you learn a new thing about both your parents in like one fell swoop. But I learned that day that my mum is a criminal mastermind <laughs> and my dad is apparently Winnie the Pooh. So. <laughs> He means well, but he just, he's just, he's just got his little eccentric ways. Like this, this like memory popped into my head the other day. I was like, was, I was about eight years of age. I remember I had a, I had a project at my school and the project was um, for history. Come back in three weeks with a model Colosseum built. So I go home that day, I'm like eight years of age. I say, dad, 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 the uh, history, they want us to build a Colosseum, a little model for, for history. And he goes, yeah, no worries, I'm on it. Um, and then it, we cut to, the night before the deadline. I'm like, I just want to circle back on the uh, Coliseum <laughs> plan. And he was like, oh yes, because he had definitely forgotten. And he, I, honestly, he was sitting at the dinner table. He looks on the floor, finds an empty wine box, flips it upside down, gets some scissors and just starts cutting like lines around it, like little train track kind of, I guess, columns. <laughs> and then he just wrote the word Coliseum on the top. <laughs> so, there you go. I'm like, all right, I'm eight. This looks fine to me. I go in and I sit in history the next day with my sad box on the table and look around and go, I have miscalculated everyone else's abilities. I look around, everyone is like, they are like bringing their A game. My friend Matt Kinn, and he's got like one made of woods with like, um, with kind of like painted sort of details on it. My friend Ben Jarman, his is like mahogany, like next level. It's got like, it's got like an even a mini Colosseum with it. And I'm just sitting there with my sad wine box upside down. And I'm like, this is gonna go badly. And so the teacher goes round and she starts giving everyone credits. I know like every school's different, but at my school they gave credits out. And so she goes around and gives that kid five credits, this kid five credits, kid next to me, five credits, me, five credits. And I'm like, she is terrible at her job because <laughs> I'm a kid and I know that this is not the same level as everyone else's. Cut to three weeks later, I, uh, we have like an assessment and the teacher goes, is there anything you want to ask me? And I said, miss, I've got to be honest. How come like for that Coliseum thing, you gave me the same amount of credits as everyone else. <laughs> I swear to God, she said to me, I gave you the same amount of credits as everyone else because I could tell you were the only person in class who didn't get any help from his dad. <laughs> and I'm there going, not only did he help me, he was actually the mastermind of the operation. <laughs> he spelt Coliseum with four S's, if I'm honest, so. She was like, this sad kid doesn't even have a dad. He just did this. He lives in that box. He flipped it upside down. He's a smart kid. So, yeah, so I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to be a protector. 
I'm not going to be a protector, Dad. I know that. I can't do the protect. I just in this country, especially, I feel more than any other country. I just the level of violence is just different to what I'm used to. Uh, like biggest example was I, I went to get my hair cut. Uh, I think it was last year I went to get my hair cut at, at the barber shop at the end of my street. And uh, my barber, he's a nice dude, but he's like limping while cutting my hair. And he's like limping. I'm like, I'm trying to bond with him. And uh, I'd injured my leg on the weekend. So I go, oh, you're limping? You just injured your leg? I go, I, I injured mine on the weekend. I go, out of interest, how did you injure your leg? And he goes, I got shot on Friday. <laughs> and I'm there going, oh, okay, cool. And he goes, how do you injure your leg? And I'm like, ah, co-ed soccer on Sunday. <laughs> so similar dudes. And I said, can, can you just, do you mind elaborating? Because I'm from England, so I don't hear about people getting shot much. I go, how did you get shot in the leg? He said he was walking down the street outside. A guy gets out of a, gar a car, pulls a gun on him, puts it in his belly, goes, give me a wallet. This guy goes, nah, slams the gun down, bullet goes straight through his leg. I don't know if you've ever been halfway through a haircut and realized that your hairdresser might in fact be Jason Bourne, but it's quite exciting. <laughs> I was like, that's crazy. And when you hear a story like that, as someone from the UK, it's weird. It's like affects your mind. It's like, it's, it's made me realize like I missed something I never thought I was gonna miss from the UK. Cause people ask me all the time, you live in America now, Chris, like, what do you miss? Do you miss your friends? Do you miss your family? Do you miss like the cultural sort of heritage? I've started to miss something I never thought I was gonna miss after hearing a story like that. And that is knife crime. <laughs> I miss the good old days when people used to try and attack me with cutlery. Those are the good old days. Because what is stabbing when you break it down? It's just a bit of pointy tickling, isn't it? Just a bit of pointy tickling compared to being shot. And I know every part of the country is different, right? And you have different rules with the guns. Like LA, they've got kind of regulations. But uh, I was doing some shows in Arizona recently and uh, they have no gun regulation at all in Arizona. I was, I was doing a gig and like, every dude was sitting in the crowd and they just had like a gun over their ear, just like a cigarette. <laughs> like, you better be funny, dude. I'm like, I try my best. But the oddest part of that whole gig was one of the comedians backstage told me he had a gun in his pocket. I go, you've got a gun on you right now. He goes, yeah, man, protection. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. He goes, well, do you have a gun? I'm like, no. He goes, well, what are you gonna do if someone comes up to you and they've got a gun? I said, mate, if I had a gun and someone came up to me with a gun, in about three seconds, that person's gonna have two guns. <laughs> They're gonna have their gun and a brand new free gun. And a snazzy holster, if they're lucky. You guys have been so fun. Before I go, I just wanna finish on this story. This, uh, <laughs> someone tried to break into my apartment um, during the pandemic. It, uh, <laughs> the timing was very ironic. It was the, uh, the first weekend of the Black Lives Matter protests. So the timing was very ironic, because in the day, I'm with everyone else, marching through the streets going, defund the police. Cut to 10 p.m. that night, where I'm like, can we leave a little bit of funding for the police <laughs> in my area to deal with this situation happening to me now? So me and, me and my wife, we're, just, we're in our apartment, mind our own business, I hear a voice outside the window, 10 o'clock at night, just go, I've been up here for two hours. I'm like, what? I walk outside and I look up and I see a man with a mask and no shirt on, which is a funny paradox, <laughs> just wedged in the barbed wire on the wall, just trying to spin out like that, just like that, ah, like a rotisserie burglar, just like there, <laughs> trying to spin out. And he's shouting, when I come down there, I'm gonna kill you. And I'm like, stay up there as long as you like, my friend. <laughs> stay up there. And then eventually, um, the, other ha the other people from the apartments nearby, we all come out and we're like, looking at this guy, what should we do? And we're like, let's call the police. So I call the police. It takes ages to get through because they're busy with these protests. I eventually get through and I go, hey man, there's a guy, um, he's threatening, uh, he's gonna kill us. Uh, he's in barbed wire right now. Just letting us know that he hates us and all this stuff. Can, can you send the police? person down and they were like all right how would you describe this man and I'm like if I was to use one word it would be the word stuck I would say stuck and they went no 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 what does this guy look like like he's in so much pain to be honest he's bleeding and screaming and they went no 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 what we mean is what color is he is, is he black or is he white now I know that's like standard police questioning but I was like does it matter in this scenario <laughs> He's the one guy in barbed wire 
outside our apartment. There's not several men of several races. And the police turn up, I'm like, ignore the Asian guy, he lives here, so... Just practicing some urban acupuncture on the weekend, right? We wait for like half an hour and then um, they, the sirens happen, we're like, yeah, and then no police turn up. I promise you, fi the fire service came and there's like 12 firemen. I'm like, 12? <laughs> were they just doing a topless photo shoot or something? <laughs> 12? But they're, we're all there, and we're pointing at the guy, we're like, yeah, you're gonna go to jail, buddy. We're like filming and pointing, going, ah, sucker. Uh, uh, and then the fire service, they put the, the little ladder against the, uh, the wall, they go up the wall, and we're like, you're going to jail, laughing at him and stuff. And then all they do, the fire service, is get some wire cutters out, cut the barbed wire, and just let him run into the street. <laughs> like fishermen throwing a salmon back into a stream. <laughs> We're like, I go up to go, dude, what are you doing? Aren't you going to arrest him? He goes, we're fire service. We don't have the jurisdiction. And I'm like, oh, but like, we were all like pointing and laughing at him and stuff. And he like definitely knows where I live. So that's a situation for me. Like I wouldn't have done that if I'd known that you were going to do that. I go, what, like, what if he comes back? And he goes, well, the police are busy. So if he comes back, I suggest you police yourself. And I'm like, I am not Liam Neeson. So that's going to be an issue for me. And he goes, what did you want us to do? I'm like, I don't know, leave him up there. Because at least I knew where he was, you know, like a spider in the corner of the living room. You know he's there, you feel safe. So then I go into my apartment and I, I start looking for like, what am I gonna do if this man comes back to where I live? Like, what are my weaponry options? I'm British, I don't have a gun. So I start going like, what can I hit? What can I use to defend myself? I start like weighing it up and what would be a, what could I just <laughs> go into my like bedroom? I'm like, could I use the clock next to my bed, you know? Say something cool like, don't be alarmed, then smash him in the face. <laughs> ah! I promise you, the, gr the best weapon I could find was a mic stand. I own a mic stand. So I was like, all right, I'm going to use a mic stand. If he comes in, he's going to pick up the mic stand. I'm just going <laughs> to... This is not me joking. It's really hard to pick up a mic stand. So I'm like, that's not going to be any... And also, if he's got a gun, that's going to be useless trying to do that. So I'm like, all right. My best bet is to try and use the mic stand, but I'm gonna have to use it to like freak him out. That's gonna be my best defense. So I decide, I'm like in bed, like awake, going, all right, here's what I'm gonna do. If I hear him come through the front door, I'm gonna get my mic stand, I'm gonna put it next to the bed like that. I'm gonna put the microphone in it, and I'm just gonna stand there and just wait, just wait in the dark. Just wait, probably bottom half naked. Just like, just Winnie the Pooh, just waiting there in the dark. How much more terrified would this man be if he goes through the front door, gets to my bedroom, opens the door, I'm there, I turn the light on and go, finally, an audience. That would be... <laughs> oh, guys, thank you so much. I love doing this. You guys are great. Thank you, DC.